Um, you're all very welcome once again. Thank you so much for sparing your time. Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, thank you, Martin and Daniel, uh, for moderating uh, our symposium this afternoon. Our chief guests and all our panelists, uh, the faculty members present, our students, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, what we're doing here today is something that a vision the Africa APC Policy Center envisage of what you see should be involved with. The many issues that happen in our midst, both on this campus but also in our community, in our homes, in our families, and even in different spheres of, of work. And the question is, what is our intervention? Assuming that you're moving in the street and you witness an abuse that is happening, what is your response to that abuse? If you're in this community and you see members of our community that are hurting, that are suffering, that are in love, that are in need, what is your response? And as you see, the Africa Policy Center is meant to be our arm of engagement in the public square. And today we are here to engage on a topic that I think is very pertinent, not only to Uganda, but also to Africa. Before us, we have our guest speaker. And we thank you, uh, he, she, uh, her short name is uh, Uju. Uju, I think I'll use that. Uh, but she is Madame Obeyaruju Kichu. Uh, she's Nigerian, but she does live and work in the UK. She's a bioscientist, and that is her full-time job. She's a scientist, a microbiologist. But in addition to her scientist's work, she is also involved in advocacy. And she advocates for a number of issues that are pertinent to society. She is a voice that we, as you see, need to join to amplify the messages that she carries across this continent and across the globe as well. She has spoken at a number of forums in Uganda, in Africa, but also globally. She's had audience with the United Nations, the African Union, the ECOWAS, and even the East African community. And she's carrying one single message. Where are the Africans? Where is the voice of the Africans? Who can best speak for we as Africans? And she adds value to her messages by ensuring the messages are empirically uh, based and backed. Often, as an advocate, you're shut down by police makers because your messages are not empirically uh, backed up uh, for having being able to source resources that have enabled us to organize today's symposium, but also for the symposium that will be held uh, tomorrow. So, Dr. Larry, thank you for enabling us to achieve this. But also, <laughs> uh, for ensuring that uh, our guest speaker is able to be here and uh, present with us. Uh, as the Ghana Christian Ambassador, I want to say, would uh, you be welcome? Welcome to Uganda Christian University, and we hope that your experience with us here will build a partnership that will grow from strength to strength. I have heard about your values, we have heard about the things that you stand for, and as you see you, we do share the sentiments that you hold and the messages that you pass on. And today, she will share with us on the theme for our latest book, uh, which is Tragic Africa. Ideological neocolonialism in the 21st century. So, <laughs> please don't fall asleep. Or if, you, if you must fall asleep, at least learn one thing and take it away from here, okay? <laughs> it's always good if you fall asleep or something and you're not paying attention. And someone asks you, what was that thing about the, uh, the APC, you know, the Africa Policy Center Symposium? You just find something, just one. Okay, nobody would know you were sleeping. Now I'm so 
grateful to be here speaking about this issue, ideological neocolonialism. People have asked me, what's that? We know what colonialism is, but what is ideological neocolonialism? Well, we thought, oh, you got independence in 1962, Nigeria got independence in 1960, Ghana got independence in 1958. This is 2020. Why are we speaking about colonialism? The answer is because we, some of us have seen signs that Africa is being dragged back to a form of colonialism. But not the type that would make us defensive. If someone came and they say to you, we want to take over the government of Uganda, we want you to be a part of our colony, we are going to all stand up and you'll fight. Everybody will be speaking about it, young people, old people. No, we can, we're not going back. Uh, minerals, perhaps not as much as before, but they want something much greater than your, your mineral resources. They want your human resources. They want the minds of the people. This time around is colonialism by conquest of the mind. So before I go in too much into my talk, I would always start with what I call my full disclosure, which is the reality of Africa. Because when I go to speak, and then I present something, normally in a place that is not very friendly environment, it's not like you see you where I know I can speak freely. This is Christian University. This is Uganda Christian University. But sometimes I'm speaking in a place where more than half of the people are actually so strongly opposed to what I'm going to say. So when they don't, they're not able to find a way to pull you down by the fact that I will put up, then they come to me and tell me something like, yeah, Africa is not a country, you know. I know that. I am African. So this is the first reality that we have 54 African countries. And Africa, definitely not a country. We are a home to one billion people. Okay, almost 3,000 different languages spoken across the continent. There are thousands of tribes and ethnic groups across the continent. There are even many creeds professed. Yes, a lot of Africans are Christians, but then there are a lot of Africans who are also Muslims. I come from Nigeria and it's 50% Muslim, 50% Christian. And there are other people who profess other faiths, so I know that. And so there is not really one African culture. Because that's what they always try to drive you down with. Don't even speak about Africa, just speak for yourself, okay? And then you speak for Uganda, you say, no, don't even speak for Uganda, speak for your region. So, because of this, I need to explain this first because I will keep speaking about it as African culture. But just note, I already know there is not one single culture. There are various cultures representing all these one billion people. But, I still stand firmly in calling African culture, African values, African this and that, because there are in fact common threads that run through the various African countries, various African customs and cultures, I have been to now many African countries. I have had the blessing of speaking to people in different places, traveling through different communities, out there in Sierra Leone, out there in South Africa, here in Uganda, in Ghana. But wherever I have been, this is what I know. Is that we as Africans, no matter which part of Africa we come from, we have cultures and we have traditions that definitely value the sanctity of human life from the womb. It's not something for question, it's not a vacuum. So when I go to a place, people always have what they think about human life as it starts from the womb. We elevate motherhood, okay, across the continent. Yes, we have all our problems and our faults, but wherever you go, <coughs> what it is what is the first thing that is the prayer for an African couple getting married today? Whether you're Nigerian whether you're Ugandan, whether you are South African, it's the one prayer that is a must. You may not end up being rich in that marriage. You may not even you may end up not having house. You may not. There's so many things that could happen. But the one thing that you pray and fast never to happen is infertility, because the Africans elevate motherhood. Doesn't matter if you don't sleep the same 
language of the Igbo person or you know the Hausa person in the northern part of Nigeria because we're here in Uganda. But as that person, that woman there wants to have children, and as her community around her wants her to have children, that's exactly how it is in a Ugandan village. So same. So we recognize also the dignity of human sexuality. I have lived now in Europe for getting to 14 years, almost 14 years. In fact, I think I'll be it will be for my 14th year in the week next week or so. I came in 2006. So the one thing that shocked me because before I went to the UK to be, of course, I lived in Nigeria. I was raised in Nigeria, and uh, you know, lived with my parents, went to university, did all of that. But then I got to England. First thing that shocked me is that I saw that people could live together without being married. And people can have all these boyfriends that they kind of live with them. And they have all these arrangements where they're even sometimes having children and having a family. And you say to them something, they say, oh yeah, my partner. So then I used to go around, you know, in a very naive way, asking somebody, well, how is your husband? Because they have two children together. And they would tell me, oh, that's not my husband, that's my boyfriend. As an African, that would shock me. Okay, but I since then have learned how to mask it. So when I'm asking, I'll say, how is your other half, right? Because you don't know how to say it. So you don't get in trouble. Then I say, well, how's your husband? Uh, <laughs> but we know that. Why do I know that? It's because that's what I was taught in my village. That's what I was taught in my home. It's the human sexuality. There is much dignity to it and so much responsibility that comes with it. A Nigerian parent will see you living with your boyfriend. They would say, okay, you come back, we would see you when you come back. <laughs> it's the time when my mother, if she's in public and there's something that I've done so terrible, she switches immediately to my native language and she looks at me and she says, I will kill you. <laughs> and I say this here and you laugh. Why do you laugh? Because I am sure your Ugandan mothers will do something similar. Yeah. The African culture, the African value. Okay, we emphasize a lot of responsibility in sex and intimacy. We know that if you're a guy, you have no right for a girl to be living with you unless you have, you have enough to marry her, okay, and be responsible for any children that you bear. That is it. We um, encourage and so we promote marriage and commitment, we respect parental rights, right? Your parents are still. Uh, much authority in your life. So that is where a lot of the Africans stand. And this is not up for question, none of this. Uh, no, this from, no matter the country I go to, no matter the language, even the French-speaking countries, I have done some work in the French-speaking countries, when you go there, it's still the same. It says, the la men shoots. So la men shoots is exactly the same. Ah, I have lost my slides. Does anybody know what went wrong? <laughs> okay, so again, with all of these things that we have in common, we do have the African dynamics anyway that we cannot escape. Things that we have not asked for, but that is our situation from country to country. All right, so many moving parts. We have economic issues and problems. Yes, there is some economic growth happening in pockets around the continent. But generally, when you look at African countries and you see all the setbacks, a lot of it has come from weak economies, um, well, political situation is not often the best, it's not often the most reliable from country to country. We have the same issues, same thing that you have here. You go to, you know, Cameroon, it's still the same thing. Okay, it's the same. It's maybe one political party system, it's maybe, you know, the corruption within politics, we all have that. Okay, my slides are coming up any minute. From now. <laughs> Where's my slide? <laughs> All right, we have security issues as well. I am from Nigeria, and I'm sure most of you have heard what is happening, especially in the northern parts of my country. It's Boko Haram, it's terrorism, things that have happened even here in East Africa, in, in, you know, in Nairobi, there are all these bombings and things like that. We do have infrastructure issues. Uh, and, and limitations where you go to some parts, maybe they don't have electricity, they don't have water, they don't have what you need, the basic things that you need for society. We have development issues that we are not developing as we ought to. 
a lot of us, as I said, a lot of our countries uh, gained independence in the in the 1960s. So starting from 58 to 1962 and afterwards, uh, a lot of there was the African awakening, the African liberation from colonialism. And so since then, what has happened? It's now been what 40, 50 years post independence, and we still go to some places and they don't have electricity, they don't have water, they don't have the good systems in place, judicial system, they don't have the basic things that you need in a society. Okay? So development is an issue, healthcare is a problem, and that's why anytime there is any kind of epidemic, if it touches Africa, everybody stops breathing for just about a second because we don't have the healthcare system to carry it. Of course, we're all worried about the coronavirus. We all know what is going on. But you tried the Ebola virus when it, when it dropped on, on you know, Liberia, Sierra Leone. Everybody was running helter skelter because they don't even have hospitals. I went to Sierra Leone after the Ebola crisis a year later and there were even no hospitals there. So how can they even handle something like an epidemic? So Africa has real problems. And so every problem that we have, every challenge that Africa faces, then becomes a vulnerability. Every African country you touch, even a country that we all look up to, like South Africa, we think, okay, that's an exemplary country and they have everything that we don't have. They still have a lot of vulnerability. And this is why the donors come in. And so the donors come and they give us funding under the social sector for an age. I know when people hear age, uh, you think about healthcare, education, you're right, but age has so many other segments to it and so many other elements to it, including loan, actually, who do soft loans? But these are the major ones, the social, under social sector foreign aid. They give money for government and civil society, water and sanitation, education, healthcare, and what they call population programs. So the first time I saw population programs, I thought, what is population programs? Now, population programs would fall under contraception, family planning, comprehensive sexuality education, and abortion, condoms as well. So I thought, okay, so if somebody had an opportunity to give us, as, a, as African nations, money for various things, and they say, you know, we'll divide it into the six or seven parts, and we'll give you one for education and this, and then you tell me what exactly they're going to give us. I thought in my mind, surely they know our needs are biggest on things like education and healthcare, and even water and sanitation, basic things like that. But then I was very shocked to see this data in their records, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is the organization that tracks foreign aid. So when I brought up this graph the first time, I shuddered. I shuddered because um, it was them who made the graph to show exactly what they are spending on. So you can change, the, you can change it. That's it. So I removed all those things that are confusing. And just to show you two major countries Two of the biggest donors to Africa, there are others, but two countries represented here. The first bar is the United Kingdom, the second bar is the uh, United States, and then the other one is other EU institutions. There are, of course, many other countries that I've blocked out, just so that I could single this out. Now, look at that, those bars. It may not mean much to you, but the most um, prominent color on there is the red, right? The red. The red stands for population programs. So they give you a bag of money and they tell you, you only use 4.3% for education. That's what the United Kingdom says. You use 4% and this is the data from 2014. The America says you use 4% for education. 5% for healthcare. Of every money we're giving you, we give you 100 shillings. Just use 5 shillings. 
questions for, for education. 2.3% for water and sanitation. 6.8% for government and civil society. 43.8% for condoms and abortion and contraception. Because they think this is what Africa wants. Now this is what the data shows. If you don't look for the data, you will not be able to find this. All you know is, oh, we're giving you money for education. We're giving you money for water and sanitation. But the question there is, how much of it are you telling us can be spent on education? And how much are you, are you spending, how generous are you with population programs? So the population programs, if you are wondering how much is it, because it could be 43%, yeah, but it might not be that much money. So let me tell you exactly uh, what is in it. This is all the things that I listed, yes? So it's contraceptives, it's condoms, it's comprehensive sexuality education for the little babies in our schools, it's abortion and abortion rights advocates, and then it is translated into the sexual and reproductive rights uh, money. That's why all that money, this is the, the influence and the effect of it. This is a news headline from Ghana. An NGO secures funding to promote safe abortion. This is only one out of the hundreds and hundreds of headlines like this from various African countries. You might go as an African NGO and you say, oh, I've thought about this marvelous program that will help us educate little children. I have this marvelous program that will help us build a small maternity hospital for women. I have this marvelous program that will help us do this, that, and the other. You may not get the funding. In fact, they will tell you there's so many people who are applying for it. But I'm not giving you ideas, so none of you should go out and do this. But the easiest way to get money from the international funding stream, anybody, anybody in any African country, you just step up to them and say, oh, I have this safe abortion program. Immediately they throw money at you. Okay, even without a proposal. So there was this man in Ghana who is not even a doctor, and initially went out talking about other things, sanitation, this, that, and the other. He was really running a very small NGO. And all of a sudden, he goes out and he says he wants to now talk about safe abortion in Ghanaian villages, and he got a grant of $150,000, just like that. Just like that. So that's how easy it is, because 43% of the money approximately is going to population programs. Now let's talk about legal abortion around the world. This is what it looks like, all right? And we can see Africa right there in the middle, okay? So Africa is in the middle, Africa is in the middle, Africa is in red, other people are in green, why? Because Africa is the part of the, one part of the world with Latin America, of course, where we've refused to legalize abortion. So of course they put us in red because danger. <laughs> but it's meant to be the other way around. This is the map, by the way. I didn't even make this. I got it from their website. So they put us in red. Red African countries. You can see a tiny bit of green at the bottom. So if you wonder, these are the people who have abortion, legal abortion in Africa, legal abortion in demand. Is South Africa? Tunisia, Cape Verde, which is the tiny country of, uh, of, of the coast of West Africa and Mozambique. Mozambique was the last African country that actually legalized abortion. They legalized abortion in December of 2014. Since then, up to today, they have been fighting this battle from African country to the other, and we have continued to refuse to legalize abortion. And even in Mozambique, where they legalized abortion, it was only by trickery and by stealth. People didn't know that abortion was being legalized. It was just quickly passed in a parliament, and then quickly they went, took it to the president who signed it into law. It was not really the will of the people. So that's how it has worked in Africa. Why has it worked like that? Because each time they try to push abortion and they tell everybody African women need safe abortion. Safe abortion, we call it. But then, every time they try to sponsor a bill, they get the bill, it goes to the parliament, it gets people supporting it inside parliament. But at the last minute, we find that the people reject it. It happened in Sierra Leone in 2015. After 2014, I told you Mozambique legalized abortion. 2015 was the next year that the International Abortion Lobby made a strike.
strong effort to legalize abortion in an African country. They lobbied, and one MP in Sierra Leone took up this bill and made a private member's bill. She put forward this safe abortion bill, and then instantly we heard about it, got on the phone, started speaking to religious leaders. I spoke to some Catholic bishops there in, in Sierra Leone. They said to me, that's good because we have an inter-religious council where not just us, but other people, the Anglicans, the Evangelical, we all are part of this committee. And together as religious men and women, they approached the president respectfully, and that bill was on the president's table. And they said to him, if you sign this bill, this abortion bill, we will tell the people to never ever support you. The president looked at the bill, the first lady was in support of it, but then the president said, I can't sign it because my people are religious. And all these people sitting here represent the people, even more than the members of parliament. So 2015 was when that bill was thrown out, and up to today, brothers and sisters, they still don't have legal abortion in Sierra Leone. That is what I call an African success story. And here is the truth. The data shows this. It's not just our emotions. Public perception in 2014, Pew Research did a survey in different countries around the world. They called up people, they asked them, what do you think about abortion? Do you think it's morally acceptable or morally unacceptable or you don't know? So they asked people in 40 different countries. It was quite robust because it was a very good um, study that compared everybody. And I've just singled out some of the African countries, well, the African countries that were picked for this survey. In South Africa, where abortion has been legal for 20 years, more than 20 years actually, 61% of the people who were questioned in this survey still said that they found abortion morally unacceptable, and only 10% said it was uh, morally acceptable. Remember that? South Africa is the legal abortion capital of Africa. They have abortion, the government pays for abortion. If you go to a hospital in South Africa, to a government hospital, you will get your abortion for free. Or next to nothing. In Nigeria, my country, 80% of the people who were questioned said abortion, never. In Kenya, 82%. In Uganda, 88 <laughs> You give them the top time Ugandans, this is why they don't like you, if you want to know. Because when the data comes out and the numbers come out, look at that, 88% of the people who were questioned said, we find abortion completely irreprehensible, morally unacceptable, no road to abortion, no road to abortion, no matter what. This is what data shows. And Ghana, people that were questioned, 92%, 92% of the people said that abortion was morally unacceptable. So the African countries are really moving in the 80 percentile. And if you go to other countries, because there were 40 countries that were surveyed, there were countries with 25% of the people saying it's morally acceptable, 14%, 30%. So it's really that the Africans stand up tall in something like this. We may not have money, we may not be wealthy, yes, we are still struggling with development and all those things I showed you, but the Africans, every time that we are asked, every time we are asked, we know that human life is precious and human life is sacred and must, must, must be protected. So the donor funded abortion promotion in Africa, even though they come to Africa, they ask people what they think about abortion, 80%, 82%, 88% still say, we don't want abortion. They say, oh, okay, we had you. They go back, and these people, they still send these people to us. IBDF, International Planned Parenthood Federation, IPAS, DKT International, Marley Stokes International. Even when we say we don't want abortion, they still go out and they send these people. All these people have prophecies here in Uganda. You probably know some of them. You see Mary Stokes. We chase them around when they're doing all these horrible things. I've done the documentary I did. In fact, it's mainly on Mary Stokes. We are investigating them. They are in your villages and they are doing all these things. You see the signboard everywhere. Why are you here, Mary Stokes? when 88% of the people in Uganda find abortion morally unacceptable. So Western governments and overseas abortion policies. This is just an example. This is one out of so many. 
because I live in the UK, it's quite easy for me to critique the British government. Uh, fortunately, we do have people within government who sometimes will listen to us. So it's good that I study some of the British policies that affect the African people. So the UK policy on sponsoring or funding abortion overseas. The UK government says, by policy, that they are ready to fund abortion organizations overseas. So, my resource international is a British organization. When they have a branch in Boima, here in Uganda, they can actually go back to London, make a grant application and say, we have a clinic in Boima, we need 10,000 pounds a month, we need this, that and the other, we need a jeep, we need that, we need that, and in your name, in the name of the Ugandans, the British government will bring out money and say, here is one million pounds for your work in Uganda. So that's what the British government, you know, it, they, it just means that Maristos can qualify for money for any kind of grant because they are an abortion service, they are an abortion provider, and the British government has committed to sponsoring that. They also say they will sponsor lobbying as well, which, if you think about it, it's offensive. It is offensive. Nigerians say we find abortion morally unacceptable. 82% of the Canadians, 88% of the Ugandans, 92% of the, of the Ghanaians. Yes, they are ready. The British government, the Norwegian government, the Danish government leave the America to the side because America is a different situation. What, is, what has gone on and what is going on in America today. But these people are ready to sponsor the lobbyists who can then come in and go to your parliament and do a party, a nice party for your MPs and tell them, isn't the abortion just nice? Wouldn't it just save the lives of women? Isn't it just nice that we give these young girls uh, contraception when they're in primary or secondary school to save them? So that's where the British money is going to, and that's what the British government says they are ready to allow. That, brothers and sisters, is ideological neocolonialism. Maristos International, just as an example, this is how the British government has given them money over the years, and you see how quickly it's rising. In 2011, they got 13.5 million. Hold on. 13.5 million a year from the British government, from DFI, the Department for International Development. You need to know one thing. While I'm going to wrap up these numbers and how much money Marisops International gets each year from the British government, I need you to think about one thing and one thing only. Marisops International, yes, is a British organization. So they have their main office in London and they, they operate out of there. But much of the money they get from the British government is in your name. It's because they have a Uganda clinics. It's because they have Nigerian clinics. It's because of the work they're doing in Tanzania. So the reason, the only reason they are getting this kind of money is because somehow they have managed to put it as development money. And if not for you, if not that we are here existing as Africa, they will not have the, the, even the mouth to ask for this money. So they get this money in your name. In 2011, they got 13.5 million pounds. In 2012, it increased to 21.05 million. 2013, 27.5. 2014, 45 million pounds. 2015, 46 million pounds. 2016, 46 million pounds. 2017, 44.4 million pounds. In one and seven year period, there has been a jump, triple. It has tripled within a short space of time. In your name. And each year, at the end of each year, you keep wondering, probably, everybody should know the Ugandans still don't like abortion. But Marissa to write a nice report. We said 10,000 women in Uganda. We said 5,000 girls. We serve this, so they write a report in your name. All the good things, quote unquote, good things that they are doing. And by the next year, the government says, good, let's give you more money because it seems like the Ugandans like what you're doing. And this is where my problem is, is that if only they heard the voice of the Africans, if only the Africans were consulted, asked what they think, what they want, this would not be happening. So, 
the Western donors have become stakeholders in Africa. Stakeholders. So the stakeholder thing, I didn't know what that was before, but all of a sudden, I said, especially among the NGOs, it's like, who are the stakeholders? Who are the stakeholders? So I said, let me look into this stakeholder thing. Now, this is the April 2015 uh, report that came out from Uganda. It is on the standards and guidelines of reducing maternal morbidity and mortality from unsafe abortion. And the reason I put it as part of this presentation is because it's yours. It's from your Ministry of Health. It was signed up at the time by the Minister for Health. All right? Um, I, had this, I had this report. I must confess to you, it's in my suitcase at the Gary Housing. I forgot it. <laughs> and when I got it, I remember that I forgot it, but I still have a few critical pages that I want you to see for yourself. Because I can almost... Um, I can almost bet any amount of money that nobody here has seen this. But you are Ugandans and I'm not. And this should have been, but you have. Oh, I'm mean, losing money, I'm losing money. Please be the only one. Because <laughs> I, I put all my hope on the fact that nobody has seen this. Most people have not seen this. This was not public knowledge. Yeah, this was published. Now, when you read it, you may have, you probably have read it, you will see entire sections that describe how to avoid the baby at different levels of pregnancy, at different stages of gestation of pregnancy. And that was what shocked me. It is a Ministry of Health document, but then it tells you exactly how to do abortion uh, on a first trimester, and how to do abortion after 12 weeks of pregnancy. It's not telling you maybe you can do maybe, it's just describing exactly how, and it's meant to be for healthcare professionals, but, Why is the Ministry of Health actually publishing a paper that describes exactly how to perform an abortion? Oh well, then we look at the very last page of this document, the, uh, the index of it, and you see all the people in the tiny, tiny fonts who came, who they are calling stakeholders. So right at the top, you probably can't see it, it says stakeholders meeting that agreed and advised on this document. And now that made sense to me because I had all that question, why did the Uganda Ministry of Health, are they saying that doctors should perform abortion are they? And I looked at the end in the index hidden in very tiny fonts. I had to get my glasses and I started reading through the list of the people who came. And these are just some of the people who came. A representative of some representatives of UNFPA, USAID, the IPAS people were there at this stakeholders meeting. The World Health Organization people were there. The Marisol Uganda people were there. The RHE people were there. That's Plan Parenthood. Hmm? Reproductive Health Uganda, right? That's Plan Parenthood. Even though they hide under that name, they are still Plan Parenthood. And we know them. So these are the people who are now stakeholders in Uganda and they're advising you of the Ministry of Health to bring out a document on maternal mobility and mortality and they're describing within that document how exactly to perform abortion at different stages. Safe abortion initiatives has been a thing for our donors, these donors that have come from different countries. This is one that I found online around the time I started doing this pro-life work. It's called the SAF project, the Safe Abortion Action Fund. This is nothing other than an account, a bank account, with lots and lots of money contributed by different countries just for abortion. Just for abortion. It's not for other things, it's not for condoms, but this is the, it's open and the name says exactly what it is. The Safe Abortion Action Fund. And Planned Parenthood was the one organizing it, but then all that money was coming from the various Western countries. This is the new one that has just come into, uh, into, uh, into effect in the beginning of 2017. You know that um, when President Trump became the president in the United States, that's why I said the United States is a little different. The US had been sponsoring abortion, sponsoring all of these things. Up until the beginning of 2017, President Trump came and he signed what is called the Mexico City Policy. 
A lot of Africans don't know what the Mexico City policy is, because when you say Mexico City policy, right before you even say policy in Africa, you say, oh, okay, it has nothing to do with us. <laughs> but the Mexico City policy is about Africa. Okay, it's about all. Because of Africa, I'm like, okay, it's about Latin America. But the only reason it's called Mexico City policy is because President Reagan, back in 1984, uh, made, he sat together with other people and they made this policy while in Mexico City. So like the Maputo Protocol is the city where it is, it was named for the city where it was actually put together. And it says that the United States government will not fund an abortion providing organization or promoter uh, anywhere in the developing world. So it's about this. So in 2000, you go back to that page, in 2017, um, up, up until then, of course, for eight years, the United States had been sponsoring Marie Stokes. They were getting money and Planned Parenthood. They were getting all this money uh, and funding in our name, in our name, in our name. President Trump came and signed this wonderful policy, and all that money was completely taken out of their hands. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was a joyful day for me. <laughs> watch Marie Stokes crying about losing money and they were crying and everybody's consoling them and that was when this organization came into play. In fact, it's not an organization as it is an initiative. It's called the She Decides Campaign. She Decides Campaign is another huge account that where everybody would throw money into and it's money for abortion. And how do we know it's about us? Even the staff project that I showed you as well as this one, if you notice they have something in common. They always use black women on their websites. But these websites were created in the United States. They were created in the United Kingdom. And they find a very nice picture of some beautiful African children or African women. And they put right there and they say it's for the sake of abortion for African women. So that's the She Decides campaign. And they have become a powerful movement since 2017. I was at the United Nations 2018 and 2019. Each time I encountered them, you know, they do their events, they have all these things, they come with documents, they sponsor a lot of people to come to the UN, so they have, they have the millions of dollars behind them. So it's what our donors have, have decided to do. These are nations, but then they are empowering NGOs that are, you know, interested in having African children aborted. Unfortunately, this slide. Okay. This is the reality that you see in African towns and villages when you go around. This picture was taken in Sierra Leone. You know when I talked to you, I told you the story about what happened in Sierra Leone and how they almost passed an abortion law. Uh, so these women, these Sierra Leone women, I went out there to tell them about how to be pro-life and all that. And I realized they were more pro-life than me. Okay? <laughs> these women knew exactly what they wanted. And they knew exactly what they didn't want. And they knew that no matter what anybody told them, that abortion was, was a terrible thing and it was bad for their children. So all they, all they just did was to support them and, you know, was taking pictures and, you know, supporting them and we were doing town halls across the country. So some of these women had all these big signs that they wrote by their hand. And this woman's sign says, we don't need any safe abortion because that's what they're telling them, the safe abortion. This woman said, we don't need any safe abortion as nothing is safe in killing. So we say no to abortion. And I often point out to people, I didn't tell her to write that sign. It has nothing to do with me. They all have their signs from their houses. How do you know? Because she spelled a word wrong. <laughs> all right? She spelled nothing as N-O-T-I-N-G. And I love to show people this sign. Because it doesn't even matter if you can't speak English. It doesn't matter if you cannot spell the word. It doesn't matter that we cannot come out and you know, present our thoughts in an articulate way. It's not a problem. We know the truth. And this woman is speaking the truth. And she is ready to say to anybody who will listen. It's unfortunate that her voice is so little and she's out there in her village in Canada, Sierra Leone, and nobody, maybe nobody will ever see her or hear her. But she has spoken. And she said she knows there's nothing safe in abortion. Nothing. And she's saying no to abortion. This is our way. But that is the donor's way. So, they keep ignoring us anyway. Okay? But this is everything I've seen across the continent. These are pictures that we've taken in various countries. Sierra Leone, say this one is in Ghana. We took this picture.
speak to one time when I was in Ghana, we were doing a pro-life event. This was in Cameroon, in Douala, no to abortion. This was in Nigeria, in Abuja, abortion hot women. Every time I go to an African country, people just make these signs and come out. I don't even have to tell them, oh, abortion is bad because this, that, and the other. They come out from their towns, from the cities, from the villages. They're all saying the same thing. So every time I pray to God, I say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, because my people know the truth. We may not have our voices being heard at the United Nations, but we know the truth. Anytime someone tries to make me doubt, and maybe I go out to speak to someone and say, oh, but you don't really represent all African women. You know what? I say, hmm, I do. I do. And mostly, especially, the African women who have not yet been corrupted by westernization. Those in the villages, those in the little, you know, the, the, the farming communities. Whenever they come out, you just ask them what they think about abortion. Keep a child in the womb. These are their thoughts. And they're exactly the thoughts of the people here and probably people in your own villages. It is the one African voice, the one African value. So, the donor is also our master. That's what I think. Because they come with paternalism to tell us they know exactly what is best for us. They know what we want, they know what we need. They come with their cultural imperialism and again that word or that term ideological neocolonization or ideological neocolonialism. That's what we have. The power, the power, the power of our donor. So just in conclusion, but before I conclude, I need to tell you that the part of the documentary, uh, which Strings Attack, which I, I have produced, uh, uh, which came out, I think, last year, I, just a small part of it will be shown today, I think four or five minutes. So if you would be patient after this, after my presentation, we will watch it together, because we want you to come and see it when? Thursday morning. Thursday morning at 10 a.m. at the at the principal's home. Yes. Excellent. So we, we are not showing it to you so that you will go away and be okay. We are showing it to you so that you think, okay, I need to hear more. Okay, so come and come with people and come and watch and listen. But in conclusion, with all these things that I've just told you, I'll tell you a little story that I shared with the group. Uh, I had a breakfast this morning with a wonderful group uh, that welcomed me and that was amazing. And I shared one story with them that I'll share with you as well. When I was little, about seven years old, I had my grandmother, my father's mother, very intelligent woman, very intelligent, but she didn't uh, have any kind of formal education, so she couldn't speak English, um, and she couldn't write or read or anything like that. So she would take me to her friend's house to visit, um, and she was already a very old woman, but I spent a lot of time with her, and I would ask her so many questions, and I would ask her, like, you know, what they did. I was so interested in the culture. When she was growing up, and mind you, it's like 80 years separating me and her. So I, but I wanted to know what was happening among our people 80 years ago. I would ask her how they did things at the time, what they did, how they did it. And mind you, my grandmother had many grandchildren. I wasn't the only one that, you know, and before she died, I think we were up to 35 or 40 grandchildren that she had. So, but she would take me with her. And uh, that particular day, at that time I said I was seven, I had, of course, the way I was doing English, and I used to speak English sometimes, and, you know, I would, I would tell her things and what they mean, and, you know, we would talk about it. So she took me to her friend's house. Her friend was also like her, another old woman, older woman, who didn't speak English, but then they were speaking in my language, and my grandmother was saying, you see this little woman? seven years old and she can already speak English and they were dancing these two women and they were dancing and I thought that's nothing special my brothers could speak English my sisters and all my cousins you know so it's not what is special and why does she dance and why does she rejoice and it was many years later in fact much more recently that it occurred to me the reason why my grandmother rejoiced and danced is not just because I could speak English. It's easy for anybody to speak English. In fact, there are Africans who speak English like the English people themselves. There are the Africans who cannot even speak our native language. But my grandmother was very smart and realized that if I can speak English, that 
that means that I can take in her thoughts, all these things that I'm asking her, all the things she was teaching me, I can translate it for the world to know. So uh, that I will be her own personal historian. Whatever she was telling me, she up until then she used to feel so powerless that she couldn't speak English, she couldn't, you know, it was just she, she, she just she just felt she couldn't relate to anyone outside of her small community. Oh, but she had this little grandchild who, praise God, will take her views and values, her ideas and ideals, the ideologies and philosophies that had led our people up to that point. I can not one day remember and translate it and tell it to the world. She may not even have thought that one day I'll be in Uganda, this far away from home, in a land that probably she never thought about being there in a Nigerian village, but that her thoughts, I'm sharing it with you. And I know that they resonate with you because it's not just the thoughts of my grandmother, these are also the thoughts of your grandmother. So the that until the lions have their own historians, the story of the heart will always glorify the hunter. So the time has come for the African people to rise up, learn the English language perfectly, learn the ways of the Western world perfectly, but know where you come from. Know your African roots, your African values, your African customs and traditions, which are good for humanity. Know what you have. And then, you drag that thing, those views and values that your grandparents taught you, you take them and you translate them to the world. Wherever you find yourself, you be the historian of the African people. You be the historian of your grandparents and your great-grandparents that what they believed in will never be lost. Why? Because they have you. Because they have you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Obianju, and thank you so much for turning up in large numbers. And there's even a, a policy guideline on safe abortion. So this case we were working on concerned um, um, how the government can, or how parliament can do, uh, codify in the constitution the acceptable circumstances for performing abortion. And at that time I was just like, I think it's a good thing because they actually made a documentary showing how women die from soloing razor blades, trying to abort children. And I was just like, I, I, I felt their pain. It wasn't until I read her book that I realized that what these people were doing was actually hurting us, where they encouraging Africans to abort, yet um, the children who could possibly be aborted could be the next great thing that could happen. And I just want to thank her so much for bringing this truth to us, bringing this statistics to us. It's, it's not her emotion speaking, but it's facts. So I just pray that we'll all be moved by this. So Martin, do you want to come and lead us in the Africanism? <laughs> come from Dr. Lawrence Adams, uh, the director of Africa Policy Center. Welcome you and extend our appreciation to you for your support and interest and your very clear intention to be a part of this type of discussion here at UCU and to be a part of making this a place which speaks to the world, the, the wisdom of God about the things that are so much before us at all times. I'd also like to extend deep appreciation to Uju for the hard work that she's done, for the experiences she's had over the years, and for bringing them here to us. We really are grateful that she's made Africa Policy Center. Uh, you're a member of us now. I'm going to find a way to hire you, but maybe <laughs> one of our staff. You said that you are already in Uganda in many ways. You said this to an earlier audience regarding your welcome in the halls of government and in the UN delegation. So let's just make you a member of UCU as well. I am not going to respond to the specific policy matters or the data that was presented. I think the other two panelists in their expertise can address that. 
I would just like to take my 10 minutes to emphasize two things. And the first is to speak to those who probably are not represented in this room, but whom you know, who might be asking the question, why do we even care about things such as this? Doesn't God only care about worship and prayer? Isn't he only concerned about the eternal things that we think of eternity? And isn't the temporality, is this life passing away? Does this, does this really matter? Why should we care about this world in which we're in, since we have a God who seems to be wanting to take us out of it? You know that, that way of thinking, and I know it's not represented here. But I think it's important for us, as, we're, as we encounter these very difficult and troubling challenges, to understand our position and, and, and why we do that. Let me read a portion of scripture that's become very important and central to my thinking about public life and to that of very many. I'm sure it's a passage that you're familiar with. It's from St. Paul's first letter to Timothy, written to a young bishop in Ephesus, in which he instructs him in so many ways about life in the church, their life together, the centrality of doctrine, the resistance to false teaching. But in the beginning of chapter 2, he begins some of his very specific instructions to them this way. He says, first of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Now that passage contains at least two verses that we're very familiar with that we often take out of context. But I just want to point you to a few things that if we had sermon length, I could expound on more. But just to note a few things. First of all, he calls to pray. He says, first of all, then, I urge supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings. Now, those are not four interchangeable words for the same thing. For casual prayer, those are four distinct words. And they put forth a very deliberate, intentional, organized, and I would say liturgical way of praying. In, a, in other words, very serious in the context of our worship and our life together. These types of prayer, which also include thanksgivings or Eucharists, are to be made for all people. All people. And for kings and for leaders. So everyone is covered. And when he says all people, he really means all people. He uses a word that can also be translated to mankind. It's the same word that is uh, in the Greek Bible, uh, in the beginning, uh, those who were created, all of, all of mankind. So this is a very serious thing. This is very central and at the very heart of our life together as Christians that these prayers be made, this way of praying. And notice who he prays for, but notice what he wants the results of the prayer to be. Four types of prayer with four effects. That we might live a peaceful and quiet life godly and dignified in every way. Four effects. Peaceful life, which means life in community, life together. A quiet life, and the word here used doesn't mean uh, quiet in the sense that there's no noise coming up the hill from the condo when you're trying to sleep at night, but it means a life of order, a life of justice. Notice that he says godliness for everyone. Everyone is designed by creation to be godlike and ought not to be inhibited from achieving that and ought to be encouraged in achieving that. And then finally, the word for dignity. The word that here is translated dignity means weightiness, significance, gravitas is another word. That we might live lives of peace, of order and justice, godliness, and dignity. And he's praying for all people that that might be achieved. So from that, we can derive the principle from the words that he uses that God really does care about the good for all people. The good life, and there's an emphasis here on life, a peaceful and quiet life. So this is a very pro-life passage. 
And it means pro-life, not just in the sense of the sanctity of life not being terminated, not being cut short, but life in its fullness. And this is desired for, for everyone. And of course, the full understanding of what the good life is includes the things eternal as well as goodness in the things temporal, the life that we live now before eternity comes to us. Now, there are two other clues in here as to why we can, can care about these temporal things. One is, it says it's very good, this is good and it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior that we work to achieve this life of dignity, justice, community, and godliness in every way because God desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now we hear the word saved and we think eternity, but the word here for saved actually means soundness, wholeness, it means health. And it refers not only to eternal health, but to our temporal health, the life that we have now in this life. This is God and God cares about it. God desires this knowledge for all of us. And then this very interesting verse that we all know, for there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Notice the emphasis on the man Christ Jesus. Our Lord Christ Jesus was wholly divine and he was holy man. But as man, God incarnate, this is the life he shared with us. He, of course, was born of an unwed mother. His life wasn't snuffed out in the womb. He was raised within a family. He was given an earthly father. And as man, he experienced everything that we experience. And he desires for us in our human life the goodness that he wants as the ultimate perfect man. So the mediation of Jesus is not only that we go to heaven, but the life that we live on earth is mediated to God. So all that we do, all that we're called to do, all of our life is to be lived before God in achieving this framework, this way of thinking. So in my thinking, those fourfold uh, effects I see as the godly or the biblical framework for policy analysis, for an analyzing the, the justice, the building up of community, the uh, affirmation and support of good life, the godly life, and the dignity, the sanctity uh, of everyone in every way. There's a lot of conclusions that we could draw from this, but let me just point out two or three of them in the limited time I have left. One is this calls us, as we have been called today very well, to be aware of all of that in the world which denies or undermines this good life of all. This is why we're called to research. This is why we're called to think. This is why we're called to know the world that we're in. We need to discern the times. And we need to see the way in which God's grace is breaking forth. This common grace for all that we can encourage. And also the ways in which His grace is being resisted. So we need this type of work. We need our own research. We need to read. Uganda needs to develop a reading of the culture so that we can, can know and discern and listen. Then secondly, let's be aware of the significance of policy. Now yes, I directed Africa Policy Center. And the reason for that is because we not only approach these things individually and informally in our communities, but we live in a world, an organized world, with the state system that we have, in which we approach things through policy. Policy is simply the organized means in which we cultivate and develop our life together. And it could be the good life that God designs for us, or it could be the pursuit of bad life. And many societies, as we know, go wrong under the influence of bad leaders, satanic influence, and other things. So we need to be very aware of which, the ways in which policy shapes this life together and our participation in it. I would also emphasize, and I think this has to be emphasized over and over for those of us that are approaching policy as Christians, we have to recognize that centrality, very central to this type of health, this soundness, this wholeness of salvation, is sound marriage, family life, godly formation of children. This is the core of everything we do in the policy world. And that's surprising in this secular state system in which we try to separate godliness and what we consider private morality from the public things. This is the way of the modern secular state system that's being developed even more and more in Africa. We often hear that we need to develop primarily 
in terms of economic security and national security. But we have to say that even those are not about the protection of special interests, but they're primarily for the protection of this good life that's lived in families and communities. That's what overall national policy ought to be. But we also know that policy can undermine, and we need to be aware of the ways in which policies can, uh, that we need to resist. And we recognize now that many states, many state systems, including the ones that we live in, are tempted to compromise the truth in order to receive the sort of aid or international recognition or international status that any small country uh, seeks. So in our own work, let's place in the center this vision of the good life. We can, we can choose the policy frameworks that God has given to us, or we can choose others that are presented to us. Between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ, he's made that very clear to us. And I want to thank you, Andrew, for helping us. Thank you. I have a, a quote, but I have a name to check. <laughs> so I'm safe. You see, this is easy, I'm okay. I want to thank the presenter. I think she has touched on many pertinent issues. But I want to point out a few encouragements in what she has said. There will be about three. One, the donors. Donors come with their own agendas from their countries. You can't blame them for that. Although they come dressed as they they are helpers, they are compassionate, they help. Of course they help who need the cash. But when they come and find a moral vacuum, they will thrive. When donors came and found that we are no, 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 no to homosexuality, those who left, left. So these are, to me, it, it, it has to do with us. We come across as very valuable. Whatever I say, they come with their data, we don't know whether they come, you know, the data is coming from, we don't know whether it, this was real or valid research, we agree, we, we start talking their language and check on their programs. So we need to be very careful. For me, um, all these uh, sexual reproductive health, it, it does not worry me that much. What worries me? is how you do in Uganda and, and of course Africa. We believe every single African is bad, is local, is a, is a result of ignorance. And anything Western, yeah, that's development. It's not. And we need to get away from that. I think you've seen this circulation on, on the social media about this president saying that and then after a while another president said the same thing our Africans we are ignorant, we marry many wives and we can't see for ourselves. And I think you've seen it. First it was Peter Botter, then it was Putin, then it was uh, Netanyahu, and recently it was Trump. I think I said, look, you people. You better start you know, stop this crap. We cannot propagate negative things about ourselves. That is the moral virtue I'm talking about. When we think everything about ourselves is bad, is backward, we will imbibe what the others say. So that is for me something to take precaution. I am a public health specialist and people came with the woman is vulnerable, the woman is poor, the woman is a victim. There are so many programs and a lot of money was poured into making this woman empowered. In doing that, they left out the man. But as God would have it, a community has two sections, equal, the man and the woman. What makes a woman vulnerable is the man's perspective of the woman. So why couldn't you um, concentrate on the man also. That is something we need to receive. Now, we have this being called a man who is irresponsible, who is violent, mm -hmm. and is just trying to, dis to, to find out who he is next to the empowered woman. 
<laughs> because the empowered woman is no longer listening to this being whom she sees as irresponsible. Do you know why God said women be submissive to your husbands? Because we needed some breaks. If you empower us, we step off. But we need somebody to say, no, wait, maybe, probably. We, have, we need some breaks. And the man was instructed to love. Because that is a missing component. So please pay attention to these things. You do not stop being a woman by staying at home to look after your children. If anything, you are more of a woman. Women now are struggling with motherhood. They, are, they very much want to stay at home and look after their children and bring them up. But at the same time, they are struggling with some form of a career. And careers require time. Which time this woman will not have. So she has to choose. Children time. If you choose children, you are okay. You are not develop, developmental, etc. These are things we need to look at. However, I said I want to encourage you. We do have now social programs. I think many of you have heard of a star party. Mm. Yes. I love that. You see, in the olden African setting, our compounds are the enclosures. Instead of these uh, walls, concrete walls, it had enclosures, and that's what we call it suffer. Now, the children of the nobility and the future king, now I'm talking about in the central region in Uganda, will be sent to this disaster party where commoners live. And these children will be taught how to prepare meals, how to uh, relate to the elders, you fetch water, you fetch firewood, you take cows to graze, all these things common people do. So that if you are a child of nobility, you would know your culture, you would know your etiquette. The future king will grow up with a commoners. That is the essence of a Sakara. So now we do have a king, Kawaka. His wife is another guy. So another guy has said, no, our children are growing up without, you know, they, they are just doing you know, these Western things are not helping. So now they have those programs every one of them. Interestingly, it's not only children of the, the tribe of Uganda who are going to be Sakara. Other tribes have also taken their children there. We have the Sakara in South Africa, in the US, okay. Europe, UK, for the diaspora. They want children to know their language. They want children to know their culture. Why are we doing the things we are doing? It's not because we are backward and we love education or anything like that. There was a reason. Let me give you an example. I don't agree with it, but let me give it to you. Widow inheritance. Was that because in Africa we were backward and we, you know, we didn't buy a woman? Actually, they were value this women. Because then, a woman who was not married was stateless. So when a man died, leaving a widow with children, the elders would gather and appoint one of the man's brothers to marry the widow, to look after that woman and her children, and of course she was expected to bear more. Now when you look at that, you saw these women, they're victims, you know, no, 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 what, what, but always find out what, why the practice is being done. And then you can reject it. I am a widow. And I will not dream of any brother in law to inherit me. <laughs> we need to reinforce and encourage these researchers to teach our children the value of culture. I want to give another example of cultural functions. It's also a forum to teach the youth why we do what we do. For example, in Uganda we have a big function called Okwanjula introduction. When the girl is introducing the man, she's going to marry. Now the paternal aunt 
is a key person because she's supposed to have made all the inquiries about the man and his family. And she's the one who introduces this man to the parents. Originally, even the parents would not know who the man is. That is why we are saying it's a bad show. But now they are boyfriends and then they cohabit and then they work. So by the time the man comes, the parents know. But even if I know this is you are my daughter's boyfriend, you are just a boyfriend. I won't recognize you as anything more. That is why we have the introduction. But it's a form to inculcate in our children the values of our society. And they are not backward. I attended an introduction ceremony of a friend of mine, and the man was from Denmark. So during this ceremony, we present photographs of our king. The man brings this to show that he also adhere to the culture. So the Danish also brought the photograph of their king. Didn't we clap? Why? Because they recognize our culture. And it's us people in this hall who have been empowered that need to go back and look at our culture and take out the positive. How come our children do not speak our languages? In Africa, a child belongs to the tribe of the man. At least, if two tribes marry, teach your child the language of the father. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, as, um, when I got the invitation, what is this about neo-colonialism? So I went to, I got the invitation I never had from the APC again. So I said, okay, uh, I went to YouTube when I looked at all your videos. I was excited. I was very excited because I thought we have all this information and one element we miss is fashion, which she has. Thank you for coming to Uganda. And I'm uh, horrified that you've been here many times and no one has told me. <laughs> but here we are. Thank you, Lord. Um, as was said, I'm an obstetrician gynecologist. And that means uh, my interest is in maternal health. Uh, for the last 22 years, I've been working in maternal and child health. And I've been working with donor agencies. I'd like to say as I I've been privileged to work with the UN. I was working with UNFP for 11 years. I worked with USAID for 7 years. And uh, here I am. But uh, while I worked with these donor agencies, I observed the way they work. And it is true they come with that, their own agenda. And I don't blame them because that's the way they understand us. We need help. I was also uh, a part of, at the Ministry of Health, we have what we call PICAC. Health Implementing Partners Advisory Committee, and uh, you can guess who the committee members were USAID, WHO, um, uh, DFID, uh, JICA from Japan, yes? Uh, about 90% of committee members were from the donor agencies. What characterized the few of us who sat on this committee was why. I realized that we've been educated for a world that does not exist. That's what we carry. <laughs> An irrelevant education. Because um, we were trained, the education, the curriculum is such that you, you are implementing, you're implementing policies, you're learning things that are taught about Europe. You remember in history, Europe learns about Africa, Africa learns about Europe. In geography, I was taught a lot about the Hudson Bay, uh, the prairies in Canada, the Rhinelands, uh, Japan. I even know more about these countries than the natives. I was shocked. 
<laughs> when I first went to the UK, I discovered that there are dialects of English. So I was wondering, why was I struggling to learn English? The Queen's English, when it was Cockney, the uh, version in Scotland. So then I was sitting in the Health Implementing Partners Advisory Committee, and I realized that all these things that we are discussing, there is really no input from the African. The other characteristic uh, that we had was that we were greedy and selfish. And I'll give you... We, we, uh, we did these jobs because we were being paid well, and we like to think that we are implementing good programs for Uganda. And I'm not saying that the programs we implemented are bad. We're working to reduce maternal mortality, to improve um, the health of mothers, and reduce also infants and uh, child mortality, which is a good thing. But for the 22 years I sat there, I soon realized that our greatest asset is human capital. And working with the United Nations Population Fund, one of our greatest uh, contributions is the International Conference on Population and Development, where we talk about sexual reproductive health and rights. Now, looking at the human capital, if you study the population of Uganda, 57% of the 40 million Ugandans is 18 years and below. So we have what they call in the population and development uh, language, we have a demographic dividend. We have been given a gift by God. <laughs> yes, the gift comes wrapped in, um, in the young people we have. A nation develops by the innovation, the creativity of its population. And you, we are at the at the point in time where the biggest proportion of the population is in their creative years, most energetic years, and if we channel this energy well, if we channel their intelligence, if we train them well, we can actually achieve the 2040 vision. But the Population and Development uh, Conference, looking at the section reproductive health, like our sister pointed out, the emphasis is on population control or population manipulation. And we get a lot of, we had a lot of money on adolescent sexual and reproductive health issues. My interacting with adolescents, I, I, uh, when I went into um, these issues of adolescent sexual and reproductive health, I understood that, okay, so we have this demographic dividend. What do we do with it? We need to protect them from HIV. Not so. How do we protect them from HIV? Instead of preaching abstinence, faithfulness, we are preaching condoms and condom use. And I have actually been on uh, the committee that focuses how much contraceptives we need as a country. And then we allocate, USID will bring in so much. No, we don't really allocate. They tell us, oh, this is what you need. We'll give you money to buy so much. And then we also focus how many, how many condoms that we need to bring in. So, uh, so those are some of the things that I, I used to do as an expert. Now, in all my years interacting with, with, uh, with individuals, fortunately, I'm also a gynecologist at obstetrician. So I in interact with people one-on-one. -on -one. And then I realized, you know, their problem, the problem of the youth is not sexual reproductive health. You know, we, we tend to hide it a lot, that you're sexually active, you can't do without sex, we need to protect you. Their, their, their main problem, really, was mental issues. They suffer depression, they suffer anxiety, and these are the things that push them into substance abuse. And once you get into substance abuse, then you are vulnerable to sexual irresponsibility. Are we together? So we had really misfired on the issues of adolescent health. Indeed, these days I no longer teach adolescent sexual reproductive health. I must teach adolescent health. 
so that I can tackle this issue of substance abuse, which makes our youth even more vulnerable to getting uh, sexual uh, diseases like HIV AIDS. And you know, what you invest in as a, a young person is what you will harvest when you are older. So another issue that the young people were uh, interested in was they would ask, they would ask us for income generating activities. And I think that's the way we really want to go. So a lot of money is being invested in population and development, and the emphasis is on sexual reproductive health, when it could be, uh, the money should be going to supporting entrepreneurship, uh, developing, you know, pe keeping people, small businesses going. And uh, that's the one sad story I, I learned when I was working uh, with, the, with the donor agencies and with the community. Indeed, uh, I also was, um, one of the programs that I, I uh, oversaw was uh, family planning. And uh, we do bring in a lot of family planning products. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, from a program view, unfortunately, we may take up family planning and they drop it somewhere because there are side effects. Side effects that nobody wants to listen to when you are doing these offers. And as a gynecologist, I know what medicines I need in order to counter these side effects. But nobody is willing to sponsor. So um, it's a way of telling you what's important to the donor and what's not. And for me, as a, as a doctor who was Working one on one with women, I need to have an answer to give to the woman when she comes and tells me about her problems. In just a few hours that we interacted, it uh, has helped me um, rethink what is my contribution to the development of the African. Am I going to continue sitting down and waiting for women to die? Am I going to continue just handing out family planning better and ignoring the, the side effects? Am I going to continue pushing down the throats of adolescents, sexual reproductive health, when I know that they are in their most creative years, they should be helped to discover? To come in contact with a, an advocate for Africanism, I, I recognize that the African woman has different needs. I used to sing that song that all use family planning to increase the household income. How? <laughs> How? By solving a pill, you have more income. Not to help her to understand what she needs to do to increase the household income. And that's what everybody wants. So um, I cannot emphasize how, how grateful I am uh, for inviting me to be here. And at see the Mothers, we have a program where we feel that maternal health is an issue beyond just improving maternal health. And um, the Save the Mothers was founded by four obstetricians and gynecologists who sat in the hospitals and realized that women are dying, you are just writing these certificates, the problem comes from out there. And out there, we needed to educate stakeholders who work in the HIV in the early 90s. Because every patient who came, I knew was going to die anyway. So you give one little medicine, and in those days, we didn't even have ERPs. We were giving cooking oil and rice, and sweet words, or positive <laughs> So we need to get out and understand what, what do people want. In, in maternal health, we have what we call the three delays, the delay at home, the delay on the way, and the delay at the health facility. Now, being medical people, we understood the delay at the health facility. But we needed to get that message out to tackle that delay at home. Why do people want to come? Do they know that there's a, a service provided? Do they know what they should do? So it's that point of education I feel now that we should be dealing with. And I'm happy there's this big debate on the new curriculum in secondary school because people are not prepared. But who can prepare 100%? But I've looked at the curriculum and I've seen it's a curriculum of helping people to learn, not about people being given, you know, information and you cram until you pass the exam in a distinction, no. It's an, it's an education that builds the curiosity within you, the learning capability, the search for information. And that's the kind of woman I want to see, who comes to the health center and demands and says, doctor, I'm here, 
that this form of family planning poses gifts. What can I take? I, I, I'm tired of the one who comes and says, my neighbor gets an injection. I also want an injection. <laughs> uh, I can see that we'll be able to handle the problems, the African problems in our African way. Thank you very much. Interesting part of every symposium, your questions. And we look forward to what you have to ask the panelists and what you know your take home was from the symposium. The question I want to put ourselves is that we have committed suicide as Africans. And one would ask who is responsible for this for this commitment of suicide? All of us, if I answer myself. How does it come about? Before we blame the Westerners coming to kill us, how much are we killing ourselves? By choosing to keep quiet where things are not going well, by being greedy and practicing injustice, by the inferiority complex that we run with everywhere we go, by our disunity and by our queen king syndrome kind of lifestyle. I am one person who has had a chance to work in US, in New York City. I was a director for Africa program in five African countries on a paper program that was looking at HIV and AIDS in Africa. Yes, it was intended to promote abstinence among young people and being faithful in marriage. Yes, it had 15 million US dollars announced in Washington DC by George W. Bush, the President of the, Republic, uh, the United States of America. But one would ask, how much of that money came to Africa? 70% of that money remained in the US. And the rest that remained trickled down was followed by the very people who announced it to come and implement with it. I was the director in New York. I had the opportunity as a director by policy to travel business class for every six hour flight. I had the opportunity to stay in a six and in a five star hotel. I wouldn't be allowed to stay in a hotel less than capacity because I was an expatriate. But how much money out of that much we were spending actually came to our partners in Tanzania, in Nigeria, in Cordoba, very, very, very little a peanut. Why is that happening? Who cares for, for fish when the sea dries up? Is it the dog that wants fish to eat? Is it the kingfisher that has been looking for fish? Or is it us, human beings? Who cares for fish when the sea dries up? We have committed suicide. How do we undo that? We have to speak out. We have to avoid the comfort zones. We have to stop being kings and queens on our continent and making us, if, you know, behave like we have no problem, yet we are dying and suffering. May God bless us. You need to speak against our injustices in our kapoos. God bless you. I think our dear Deputy Vice Chancellor, our Chief Guest, our guest speaker and panelist, lecturers, president, student leaders, and everyone in this whole have own capacity. Good evening. My name is Aaron Amanya. When I saw the theme for this symposium, which is Target Africa, Neocolonialism in 21st century, I tried to look at which policies are portraying neocolonialism in Africa as we speak. One is who defines Africa? Mm. I will say Africans, most cases they don't define Africa. It has been defined by foreigners. At first they defined it as the black continent. They also defined it as third, Af third, Af third, Af third countries. Now they are defining African countries as developing countries. So, we Africans, we do not participate in defining our own continent. So they give us a name that makes us inferior. 
that is one. I think it's one African person who has tried to define Africa, who is from Tanzania and is called Audatif Abda in his poetry work, Mamit Africa. So, the next thing is the policy in the leadership. If you remember so well, after the independence of African countries, who's were so frequent in Africa? In Uganda, we had one. In most African countries, we had one. So you ask yourself, who was the person behind these goals? They are the ones. And the reason is making policies to uh, for neocolonialism. I want to be so much brief. <laughs> so, explain. Yeah. Just to ask you, uh, I'm just requesting, what is your question? No. My name now is a suggestion, not a question. It's a comment. Yes. My name is a comment, not a question. Thank you. So, finally, on population control, they are talking about abortion, they are talking about family planning methods, but my submission is God designed family planning for himself. There is a period for which a lady cannot conceive, maybe from the first day of birth after like 15 years. Then after, like from 45 onwards, she cannot. So I think it was in God's mind that family planning is necessary and we don't need to look for artificial thank means. You so, thank so you so much. much. I'm here to say thank you so much. For me, I'm seeing uh, Reverend Adams. This may be the reason, the, the main reason why you were born. Um, would you? This may be the main reason why you were born. I am so happy. I have read your book. Now I'm seeing you and I'm so happy to see you. Now, what you presented reminds me of uh, Alice Bailey's 10-point program and the first point was if sex is free then make abortion legal and make it easy and by the, the young people today or the women of today especially those who have been to school abortion comes so easily it's something that they have had and has come common in their hearing and this is making us help the other world to achieve their goals. Let's from today, let's say no to helping them achieve their goals. And at the end of the day, you see that this is just a big evil plan to help evil spread in the world. They're helping Satan to, 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 to spread his, his plan. Uh, finally, I think I'm done. Thank you. Uh, my name is Shira Bukho. Um My question is, um, how exactly do you manage to sustain yourself like, in this fight for this pro-life fight, despite all the big organizations that exist? And, you know, you've shown us all these organizations and they're definitely pro-choice. I'm just wondering, how exactly do you manage to stick to this fight, this pro-life fight? Because I myself am a pro-life person and I really struggle with a lot of fear. So I want to know exactly how do you do it. What are the separate reasons behind this initiative not to not to Africa? Um, thank you very much. My first question goes to Dr. Tabuchi. Uh, this is a very pre good presentation that you gave us. But you realize most of us, we may not have the capacity to go down to the village. So do you have a network that you work with? Because most of the people who are affected in Uganda, they are local women down there in the villages. And they need this information more than any other person. Then to Dr. Lawrence, um, and actually to all the panelists who are there, African Policy Center. You realize that most of the presentation is directed to us, the women, the girl child. But you realize when we get married, we function under the rules of the husbands and the men, as it is to the African setup. So do you have programs or planning to put their initiatives that target men specifically, that they also get involved in this fight? Thank you very much. And let all of us go back and implement what we have learned. Faith without action is dead. First question. In your presentation, you talked about children's rights. The fact that at a certain point, the consent of parents have been taken away. We have seen um, the laws of the Africa in Texas, where the children have to have the same. 
Now that the child could be a born in much other places. But also the get realize that there's an issue of children's rights in Africa and a lot of torture and abuse and all that. So my question is, how do I strike the balance between the two? Then the second question, you presented a lot about the facts of how much is flooded in Africa for funding abortion. And um, you've given a lot of moral perspective of the effect of abortion and culture. Um, I would have loved if you had talked about the scientific effects of abortion as opposed to the uh, I love morality, but somebody that is not morally would, would argue you out. So, uh, culture, so, how could you tell me the effects in, in the scientific way? Then, um, the last question, and this can be the statistics of a few seconds now. Um, a new vision report stated that in Uganda, 1,500 women died per year as a result of unsafe abortion. So, it means a lot of faulty or trying to carry out abortion. And it also says that. Um, out of the 26% of the maternal death comes as a result of unsafe abortion. And it says that 9,000 to 2.2 million pregnancies are unintended. And my question is, we are aware of these facts that abortion is going on. So, um, should we ignore the fact that abortion is going on and do nothing to it? Or should we be alive to that fact? And if we should be alive to that fact, is the solution legalizing abortion? or not, and if not the place in the then what is the problem that we can avoid all this? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the question about the brain. I think we, as I said before, if we neglect our responsibility, we will get a battle. And that's where all the other world is coming. Children have a right to shelter. They have a right to food. They have a right to education. They have a right to safety. So if the parent is not providing these rights, then you cannot talk about right to contraception for an eight-year-old. If parents are sitting and providing these basic rights, the child will not need all these things because there will be parental protection and there will be parental guidance. We also need to bear in mind that where the society has been very permissive towards children, the children have grown up in things they cannot control. You know these gun wearing students, the children who come and they start shooting at random and they shoot themselves. All that could be a result of this parental failure. If a parent is doing what he's supposed to be doing, then the question of these rights and the other rights do not arise. Because the parent knows their responsibility and the child's rights are being taken care of. And the children will be told to be planning from home. So an eight-year-old with the problems of family planning, I mean, I'm a mother and a grandmother. I never had that conversation with my girl always about family planning at eight days. Now they are married, we do talk about it at its proper time. But I've given them that parental protection and make sure that I make their rights. The other rights, whatever they call them, you release the child gradually. As they mature, to make their choices. But as a parent, you explain the sequence, the, the consequences of the right of the choices they are making. If you are saying you want to go to contraceptives at 10 to 10, who are you telling me that you are sexually active? Why? Parents should be able to have this conversation with their children. But the problem is now parents are too busy. And you think schools will come in and do that party. They won't. So we have teachers who are results of unparented children. <laughs> and so they think they need to help these children who are not parented. No, that's not right. It's not right. And it's not correct to give that kind of freedom to an eight year old. The gynecologist will tell us that an eight year old, the system does not develop and you are introducing hormones. Because what contraceptives do, is to cause a hormonal imbalance of some sort that there is no 
uh, you can't conceive. That's so. Now, you want that to start in an eight year old, it means you are creating a cohort of women who will never have children. Thank you. The question from Frank was how do you deal with the problem of abortion? And uh, first and foremost, everyone has a right to know. So, uh, encouraging abortion is taking away the life of the child. So, what do you do then? Prevention is better than cure. So, prevent pregnancy. And there are many ways of preventing pregnancy. Education, for one, abstinence, and we say uh, ABC. It's, it's you know, similar to HIV. However, Society alone had a way of protecting the girl child and uh, this is where we fall back on our cultural uh, norms and things like we start fighting, uh, you know, promote the values of protecting the girl child. And I think even the programs of girl child were intended to improve protection for the girls, but not to isolate the boys. So uh, we must do all we, have, we can within our power to protect the girl child. Uh, one time I was living on a village where uh, girls were being raped at night as they were asking, those of us who were asking, what were you doing? What were she doing out at that time? After one, one a.m., midnight. And we realized that these are the girls who work in bars, who work in uh, restaurants or work in these uh, roadside markets selling chips and all. They work until late so they can sell and get some money. So now they're walking home at uh, midnight, at one, all alone, and they get rich and some of them are there. So what does society do? We were encouraging the girls to get jobs where they don't have to work too late. And then the LC descended on the owners of these businesses. The business must close at 10. Let the girls go home. So what can you do within your sphere of influence to reduce the vulnerability of the girl? It's not just a matter of empowering the girl, but even the politics environment should be able to protect her. I'll just add a few things to that. These are excellent points uh, about um, abortion and the fact that they always bring up the very common sense question that you have got. We hear it all the time. Uh, if they report the Mutana mortality, they tell us how much of it is because of illegal abortions. Um, they post uh, figures to show how many people have been harmed uh, because they're going out to seek abortion and all of that illegally. Okay, so they go with us to see the legally. Now, I always like to bring up a few things in confrontation to that question. Because it is a genuine concern, and it is a genuine question. And yes, it's the reality of all the world. So I connect back to what the doctor has said. Um, in speaking over the root cause of how we are getting so many cases of young people who turn pregnant is the fact that we hardly ever speak about the vulnerable uh, African women. This is the amount of sexual exploitation within African, uh, some African communities. It's unbelievable. It's on, and in this age, unfortunately, in this age of pornography, I do not have to say here, but people must know that there is so much more high sexual behavior than probably ever before. And nobody is talking about that. Nobody is talking about how to stop what is causing it, but they're telling us, provide your abortion so that then they don't end up. Okay? So it's usually the girls who find themselves in the most vulnerable situations and then they think, okay, let me quickly do something to solve this problem. That is why. It's the root cause, and we'll find out that we even flash a whole uh, path of that statistic that we have quoted. Uh, then there is also the situation of the fact that we cannot deny what abortion is. And yes, it is true, I come very much, very, I come very strong on the moral side of things. Because even from a scientific point of view, it is true what we believe that a child is a human being. 
So for me to say, do not kill, you know, this is young man sitting here. From a moral perspective, it's wrong for you to kill him. I don't have to even give you a scientific reason. But then if you say, well, why are you telling me morally that I can't kill him? But I'll tell you scientifically, uh, the reason why you shouldn't kill him is because he's a human being just like yourself. Uh, and so he has the same rights as yourself. In the same way, a child in the womb gestating, going in the womb, science continues to show us day after day with all the uh, you know, 2D ultrasound, 3D ultrasound, 4D ultrasound, we are seeing films of baby moving inside the womb. We know so much more about uh, the sentience and how much they can feel pain, how, what is happening with the baby's growth, with how they are developing, the fingerprints, the, the behaviors, how they are adjusting to sound, to light, to everything within the mother's womb. That means that child is everything worthy of protection as this young man who is sitting here. So I should give you a moral reason why you shouldn't kill the child. And also the moral reason is also very much uh, strengthened and, and supported by the fact that it's a child just like yourself. Now abortion is the one thing and the one and only thing where somebody then comes to us in international forums to tell us, well, somebody will still kill this man whether you like him or not. Why don't we find a safe way? A safer way. Because you know if you are trying to kill him, you can in the process hurt your own self. So let's make it safe for you. Anybody who says that will say no. Who say no to it. Because the child simply has the right to life. The right to life is the first human right. It's the most basic human right upon which everything else sits and stands. So instead of them trying to tell us, oh, we can't deny that African women are having abortions, well, we can also deny the fact that African women are being raped and need to make it safer for the rapists. We cannot, make, we cannot deny the fact that so many more people are being kidnapped in Nigeria as we speak today. Kidnapped rates have so skyrocketed. What am I to do? Am I going to go out and make it safer for the kidnappers? No. We need to find urgently a solution to the problem. As what happens in every society when you have a huge vice that has come among you is to attack the root cause of the vice and to completely eliminate it or eliminate it as much as is possible. So I have written in this book, in the chapter on abortion, everything, or at least a lot of things about abortion and the so-called safe abortion and, you know, the logic, you know, the, the very general concerns which the international community brings up and what the African response should be. And what the response, not just of the Africans, but every, every person who is pro-life, is that what we say, yes, is a moral perspective, that the child in the room should not be killed, but it's also, you know, strengthened and fortified by science. Medical science shows us that this child is human being. Before the 1960s, everybody, almost everybody in the world agreed. Uh, the medical uh, associations across the Western world agreed. It's a child in the womb. And um, even when the, the, uh, the resolution on the rights of the child in 1959 was put forward, even then, in 1959, at the United Nations, uh, they did specifically say that a child should be protected before as well as after birth. If you're saying before birth, they are then saying that abortion will happen before birth. And one thing I say to everyone just in conclusion to this particular question is about abortion. Every single person, even if you consider it as a little pro-choice or this, that, and the other, and you cannot really relate to the fact that this baby in your womb deserves protection, the same protection as you and I, do me a favor, everybody. Discreetly touch the one cell we all share. This belly button. Call it belly button. Your belly button. We all have it. Every human being there. You know what that is? That's the cell we got from being a one child. That is the exact spot where the 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 connection, what connected you, the umbilical cord that connected you to your mother, where you were, from where you were getting food, getting oxygenated blood and all of that, then it was pulled out when you, were, when, you were, when you were delivered or it fell out after a couple of days after you were delivered, but you still bear that scar. That means whether we remember it or not, each of us was one, once upon a time a child in the womb 
feeling out of an unbreakable cord and it has now left a scar that will carry to the day you die. As long as you can feel that scar, it is your responsibility. By God, it's your responsibility to protect all the other babies who are in the position that you want to be. At about uh, getting to people in the rural area, the simple answer is it takes you know, resources to get to people in the rural area. And that is where they are spending us, and that's where they are. Um, going beyond us, and that's where you know, they have all their jeeps and their SUVs, and they can go to places that you and I cannot go. Even when it comes to organizations, yes, like Aristos, they have what they call their mobile clinics. So they will find that your auntie deep, deep, deep in the village wherever they are, and they're going to go out there and they will leave at the IUD and they will leave the same day. So that's, that's the benefit that they have from all the millions that they get. So the simple answer is no. But then, there is hope. And what is the hope? The hope is the church, which is the network from which we will work. Because every part of this country, there are people praising and worshiping God in churches. Mm -hmm. Thank God for that. Even if you have people in the most rural parts of this country, yes, if they may never come out to Kampala, you know, maybe they come out to Kampala very rarely or never, but then they have a bishop, they have a pastor, who comes out for synod, who comes out to meet other people, who comes to UC for some meeting with other, uh, you know, with other uh, members of the Anglican Communion. And through that network, through the congregation, through the body of Christ, I think we can reach people even in the most remotest regions. And this is why our opponents fear our network. This is why they want to discredit our Christian networks. This is why they try to, to stop us. Because once we wake up to the fact that we know that this message that we have and all these things that we are sharing, it can indeed get to the ends and ends of this country through the church. Once we find a way of uh, firing up that network, of really putting it into action, I tell you, there is nothing they can, they can do to stop. The struggles. Because by the time the mother clinics get to the place, if the message of life, if, if the gospel has reached there, and the fact that it's not just, yes, the gospel of Jesus Christ, but the gospel of Jesus Christ put into action, the gospel of Jesus Christ for fortifying and strengthening people to stand up to protect uh, real human life and real sanctity of life and witnesses to people to human, uh, of human life. Once we do that, then the game is over. And they know. So I think our duty and our work and this time around our life in this community is to find a way to fire up that network and start it off and make sure that through the network of the church uh, we can get the message to every part and get every program or initiative to those parts of what we have to do more. It is true, we have to do more. Uh, but we also realize that we do have the advantage of, of the body of Christ, which is already standing, it's already there, it's for us to know. Yeah, so the opposition is there, and they are so powerful. And you saw how they get, you know, just a fellow of 12 million pounds a year, and they get now 44 million pounds a year. And by the way, the CEO of Maristot School's office is in London, Simon Cook, and his salary is more than 400,000 pounds in a year. That is more than the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. It is, in fact, more than twice the salary of being Prime Minister. So people have questioned him even in the East because these are very powerful people. And they are so equipped that they can go anywhere. And a lot of that funding goes into like their program. So they, they have like, unlimited uh, resources. You know how, oh, I'll say it here, I'm sure Dr. Lawrence probably will be upset with me. I know he has spent a lot of money from his APC project to bring just one program. Just, this might be it, right? <laughs> because now the ABC people have broke because I came. <laughs> Imagine that he has the resources to bring people every month to this place. For goodness sake, there is many more people that, you know, and, or he, he can take people to other parts of Uganda and do an APC event in another part of the country because the resources is not a problem. That's how it is. For yeah. <laughs> That's Which sort of empowers the weak 
So if anybody is threatening you or you know coming against you, you just do one thing. You take it to social media and let the world know. Let the world witness it in real time. A couple of uh, months, a few months ago, uh, some Ugandan feminist came after me on social media, and she's from the AW, the uh, the Afro Women Development Fund. I think. By the way, AW gets about five million dollars a year, so they go from Paris to me, you know, they get tons of money. So this woman, she's Ugandan, she's a feminist, and she said that Uju, she works for the patriarchy, she's strengthening the patriarchy, she came to Uganda, she showed a documentary to our MPs, and now our MPs are going out and telling people about the documentary. So she was coming after me so strong. All I told people was to take her to social media. And goodness, I think she must have regretted it, because about 300 Americans woke up that morning and they were like, keep quiet. So you know that there are people who think like you and people who believe what you believe, even in America, even in the United Kingdom, there are poor life people. We may not see them on TV, they're not doing, you know, they're not the Hollywood stars, they're not. But let me tell you that a lot of regular people in the UK, even in Germany, even within the, the European Union, yes, still believe what you believe. So it's for me, I always depend a lot on, on taking things out to the public and how I do that is through social media and they will be afraid of one African woman or one African man if you have the facts and you are unafraid to challenge them. I think I was also asked a question about whether ABC was doing something about well, that. Man. Yes. Man, yes. And let me speak to that briefly. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> the um, answer to that is we do not have a program that way, but let me use this as an opportunity to say that quite often now that APC is on the ground, I'm approached by saying somebody needs to do something about X, and uh, why aren't you pursuing this policy agenda item? And I want to say that APC is very, very open to participation of many, and I'd like to invite anyone who has an idea to come to us and also offer your services, <laughs> not just demand that our very small staff and limited resources are able to solve and answer every policy question. I don't mean that to send them gracious, but I mean that as a really an invitation and, uh, to build awareness of the fact that we're a young and growing policy center. And we really do want to uh, be concerned about all dimensions of it. And just in regard to the boy child and to men, I was made aware uh, because I happened to be with Dr. Wilson in Washington, D.C. a few weeks ago. And she was describing to uh, someone else that was with us, uh, a woman named Mary Everstead, who, by the way, is coming to Uganda in October to be the public lecturer, who's a very good friend and, and uh, uh, on the same way as Uju. Uh, and she was describing how the mother's union has now taken up the question of the boy child because they've recognized the way in which that's been affected. And all of the questions that are raised about the behavior of young men and support for them. So I would like to link with that and learn more about it. Thank you for the cultural suicide question. I think it's very profound and very pertinent. And uh, thank you for bringing that to us. What it tempts me to want to do is switch into my political science mode and give a lecture. And let me try to just boil it down to, to three very simple points, which I think have profound consequences. And they're to some degree cultural, but they're also structural. Uh, the first does have to do more with the matter of confidence and attitude and sense of who one is as a people. And what I would like to say is, yes, it's true. We know that historically, Africa has been the victim of other powers. But a victimization mentality is always going to stifle the confidence that one needs to move forward. So let's be historically aware and objective and let's recognize that the sins of the past, yes, need to be repented of, but they can be corrected. We can't go back and do them. So let's uh, build on the fact that in our weakness is our strength. In our weakness is where we draw our strength from God. And let's know from what we've learned from that, not to sin in that way against others and not to sin in that way against e each other. So that's more in the uh, realm of, of, of attitude, I would say. And I, I think that's changing a lot. I mean, the things that I'm hearing even today give me great confidence that, that Africa's getting back on its feet and this awareness of the significance of Africa. You know, Africa, uh, the population in Africa is growing and it's 
declining everywhere else. Uh, in a very short time, a very, very large percentage of the globe is going to be African. We know about all of these demographics. Let's get organized and realize that Africa is now called upon to lead. We already see this in the church. In the Anglican world, it's the African leadership that's taken this forward. And I think this is also true in Roman Catholicism and every other denomination. In the United States recently, the United Methodist Church has split because of this question of whether homosexuality is going to be sanctioned and allowed to marry or not. And the reason it's splitting is that the Nigerians and the others that are living in uh, the United States and are Methodists are not putting up with it. <laughs> so they've created a separate church. The Ten Commandments. Now the second two things are more structural. Uh, the second thing that I'm very concerned about is the adoption and the swallowing and the inculcation of what I call the development paradigm. If you accept the notion that development is the model that explains who you are, meaning you're underdeveloped, <laughs> and that you need to develop, and that you have to accept the design for what a good society is that comes from elsewhere, then that also is going to contribute to cultural suicide. Now, in this category, I put such things as the sustainable development goals. I know that those are considered almost to be holy written now. They're evoked as if they come down from on high without any question. I really would like you to challenge that whole paradigm, that whole notion. I've heard recently of discussions about ideas changing the entire curriculum of a university, even a Christian university, to match that of the sustainable development goals. And, just, and to define the same sustainable development goals in terms of human needs, education as a response to human need. Think of that in terms of the contrast to the idea that education is an exploration of the truth and the inculcation and learning of that. There's much more we can say about that, but really we want to challenge the development paradigm. That leads to the aid addiction that she's teaching us about in the book. And this touch on so much today that has come up in other, other circumstances. The final thing, and this would require a lot more elaboration, but be aware that the political system and the structural system that Uganda and all African nations now work in and operate in really needs revisitation. Every, the reason Africa is divided into 54 separate so-called independent uh, countries is that we've adopted this model of the state system. And the international state system says that every nation state is autonomous and independent and separate from each other, is sovereign. We've adopted that notion of national sovereignty. And within that is the idea that the nation state itself controls and contains all power and all authority. So what that tends to do is to marginalize and reduce the real authority, say, of the church or of the family or other or the cultural institutions that we talked about. We've adopted this modern Western liberal state system and now impose that on Africa. And we're trying to work within that. And each leader of the state system, each political party in power, each president is bought into that system. <laughs> and they're benefiting from it. But hardly anybody else is, as you know. Uh, all of the resources, all of the power is going there. This is a really, really big question. But I urge us as Christians politically to think this way and to realize that it's not necessary to chop up the up and trip, 54 independent states. We need to really rethink the whole way we think about power and authority and cooperation and collaboration. And this, this is a big challenge. This is a lifetime of reform. And let's not just limit it to, let's be good people, let's be nice people, let's have our traditional African values, all of which we have to do. But we have to realize the system that we're in and think creatively and carefully, because the state system is not working anymore. It's collapsing. Uh, it's rotting from within. And you see it even in what you think of as a successful state like the United States. There's real trouble ahead. And I think it's true in other states, like Nigeria, and maybe even maybe even Thank you. Gentlemen, we come to a conclusion of the symposium today. Let's give our chief guest for the panelists another round of applause. I know that uh, our time is up. Therefore, no remarks, but two things. I'll just like to pass on a vote of thanks, and then eventually uh, I'll turn. Uh, 
uh, like to thank uh, our guest speaker. Yes. Uh, Uju, thank you. We sold seeds in our hands. And those seeds are going to germinate. Uh, each of us is a different seed that is going to germinate. And you will not live to see it, but those who will harness those fruits will know that something planted that seed. So thank you for doing that. And to our discussants, thank you for sharing with us the insights into some of the work we've done. Particular subject. And also like to thank uh, the special ABC for making this possible. And each of us is, is carrying away something. And I'd like you to pause and ask yourself a question. What is it that you're carrying away from this symposium? I want to ask you to put up your hands. But if this is been valuable time, let us promise ourselves that we're not going to only stop here, but take that away and be an ambassador of that message. In the environment that we live in, in our halls of residence, in our classes, in our workplaces, in our community, that we become ambassadors of that message. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, each of you. Having stated, I know that it's been quite a straight session, I can say, and this is a demonstration that the subject matter here has been very and to all partners who have traveled and coming, well, thank you for joining us.